so much. We are so grateful, so thankful for your wonderful Sabbath day, a day of rest where we can come together and escape the world and the things of the world and come here and to be refreshed and reassured of your grace, your mercy, everything that you've done to, for us individually. Lord, you have led us uh, out of the world and into the promised land. And we love your, we love your parables. We're like children and we love the pictures and we love, we love your word coming to life. Thank you so much, Lord. And we pray that this, this study today that Parminder has done, I just can't, I just can't help but smile and, 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 and think that you have such a wonderful sense of humor, how you're bringing this message today at this point in time where we have all these questions about your people in the world. And I just thank you so much, Father. You are doing miracles even in our daily lives. I pray for those who are suffering, Linda, with pain. Lord, please do whatever you can because it is, it's just horrible to live with pain. And, and I thank you for um, uh, Sister Tony and, and how she is uh, just doing so much better, Lord mentally, physically, you're, you're just leading her. And it's just a refreshing and wonderful to hear. I pray that you would be with her in this time of transition. Thank you so much. I also pray for Susan and her time of transition into this wonderful home, this country home that she's, that you have brought to her. What a joy, uh, lots of things to do, but also such a joy that she's only one hour away from her, her daughter and her, uh, her family. Thank you so much, Lord. And I pray these things that only you will be lifted up in this time of study. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Okay, now this, this is going to be a whole different way. Uh, so I'm going to definitely probably make mistakes. So please have grace on me. Um, I'm going to bring my, hold on, let me bring the screen up. Okay. Okay, wait, hold on share. Can you guys see it? See it, yes. Okay, good, perfect. Okay, hold on. Okay, this is the final presentation in this series, and it has been quite a wonderful series for me, at least. Um, this this is God's people in the world. And we were reading about this this morning in Sabbath school. And it's gonna give us a better picture of who these people are, what their character is, um, and, and their characteristics. Uh, in particular, it focuses on the nethonyms of our time. Um, if some of you remember, we discussed it in our previous study uh, when we refer to the world, we're not talking about the world as a whole. We're talking about God's people in the world. I don't know if any of you remember that. Um, but hopefully at the end of this study, we'll have a better understanding of God's people in the world. I'm not, there's not going to be words, not much words. I'm not going to be reading off the screen like I used to. I have my little template here. And so um, if there's any mistakes on here, please speak up. Now this, this study is only has 30 about 37 slides. So it's about half the size of my other studies because everything's paraphrased. I had to put things in my own words, which you know was quite a feat. Um, but I, I'm gonna need your help and participation because if I don't, then we're gonna be done with within like 25 minutes. So I, I'm gonna ask that you know whatever feedback anybody has, questions, whatever, this is the time. It's a wonderful study and there's so many questions just like how we had in Sabbath school. Okay. We're gonna talk, take a look at the story of the conversion of Cornelius. Uh, we're gonna go to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, page 136, paragraph one, a seeker for truth. Many of the Gentiles have been interested listeners to the preaching of Peter and the other apostles and many of the Greek Jews had become believers in Christ. But the conversion of Cornelius was to be the first of importance among the Gentiles. 
this first of importance is very important. And we discussed a little about this this morning. That's why I just love this whole day because God has planned it so that we're all our questions that we had this morning are hopefully going to be answered with this study. Okay, and if we go back one paragraph, she's talking about the vision that Peter had on the rooftop, on the rooftop with Simon. It revealed to him the purpose of God that by de the death of Christ, the Gentiles should be joint heirs with the Jews. So in other words, she's saying because of Jesus' death, the Gentiles could also have salvation. However, up until this point, none of the disciples had preached the gospel to the Gentiles. In their minds, the wall of partition had been broken, had not been broken down yet, even though the Bible teaches that the wall had been broken down by Christ's death. They don't have an awareness of this, and they're still only preaching to the Jews. And if we read this morning uh, in uh, Desire of Ages, it talks about Jesus was beginning to break down the, part, the wall of partition because he hadn't died yet. So he's starting before, he's starting early to break down that wall. This is an important concept in this whole study. But the Lord was seeking to teach Peter the worldwide extent of the divine plan because, the, because um, the disciples don't know that that wall has been broken down. They don't have an awareness of this and they're still preaching only to the Jews. So Christ is gonna teach Peter. It's going to go from the church or you could say the Jews to the world. So that's where we get this idea from the church to the world. We have any questions here um, about this? So Jesus is now beginning to break down the wall of partition. The conversion of Cornelius was to be the first of importance among the Gentiles. What does, what does this mean, this, the first of importance? Does anybody have a clue? Does it mean the most important? Well, it's the, talking about the conversion. So the, the conversion of Cornelius, it's the, this first conversion is the first of importance. It's related to the conversion of him. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, he's a symbol of something. The okay. first fruit? Yes, he's a symbol of the first fruits. It all goes back to the agricultural model. Again, God uses nature which is really just perfect and beautiful because when we look at a field and we look at the wheat, you know, these, these how, this is how God teaches us. Yes, it's a field and yes, it's wheat and it's fruit, but it's also a symbol of people and, and timing and where we're at in the, in the agricultural model. It's just beautiful. Any more comments here? When you say first fruits, what first fruits are you talking about? It, this this whole study is is all about the nethanims. Okay. So, a good, of course, in this particular uh, story, we're talking about the Samaritans and, and and those people. But in our time, this is particularly the nethanims. So, the Cornelius was the first fruits of the Samaritans, or what they what they would be considered the world. Yeah, I don't think it was a, of the Samaritans, but yeah, because the Samaritans the world. were linked to linked to the um, the Gentiles same category. But the, yeah, but they're yeah okay. The first fruits of the Gentiles, which we would call well, we could call Gen we could call the Nethanims Gentiles too. But you know, it's all the same Samaritans, yeah. Gentiles, yeah. Nethanims. These are a group of people. Any more questions? So he is first fruits of the Gentiles. A devout man and one that feared God with all his heart, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. What God is, okay, so what God is Cornelius worshiping because he's a, he's a devout man, he fears God, uh, he prays and he gives alms. So what God is he praying to? Is it the God of the Jews? But isn't Cornelius a Gentile? 
when we saw in the other study that the Samaritan woman, she understood that salvation was not only of the Jews, but of the Gentiles as well. He's praying to the God of the world. He's right. Yeah. So he doesn't fully understand who God is, right? Can we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. But he is still praying and he still has characteristics of a Christian, basically. Does anybody have a comments? One that shows that he, one that shows that he loves God. He may not know all things, but he has love for God. Yes. And this is really important because when we're looking, you know, we're going to have to be eventually going to the nethanims when we're looking, but, but we can start now. Okay. This is this block, this drop down block box just popped up on my thing. I don't know where that came from. You can, we don't see it. So, okay. I just minimized it. Put yeah, it. I'm, yes. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find somewhere in Romans uh somewhere in romans i think it's chapter six where yeah. it's talking about well, I'm, I'm looking for it he did quote romans in this but he didn't quote the chapter and the verse but yes if you uh, so, something about the law uh law into its um those who didn't know god but there were you know those who may not have known god as god but they were practicing the things, the law of God. Yes, right. Yeah. That's another picture of, of the nethanims for us. Yeah. yeah, he was caring for his fellow human beings. Yeah. He much alms to the people. Yeah, he was. He had that, um, he gave grace to people. He treated people with Dignity and respect and love and kindness, just like Jesus did. Gave of that which was given to him, he gives of that rather than selfish and keeps to himself. Right. He's liberal to, in that aspect, as opposed to conservative in that aspect. Right. So what does I was God do? Say that he yes. Sorry. I was just going to say that he understood the six because of the alms and yeah. was, uh, tuned into that. Yes. And you see all these characteristics that were popping up and then we're, we're coming up with. These are the characteristics that these nethanims are going to have. All these things right. that we're talking about, they're all going to have these characteristics. I, I was thinking about the first angel's message too. Because he feared God. And we know that we can't receive any of the other messages unless, right? We receive yes. the first angel's message to fear God and give glory to him. And by him giving those alms, he's yes. giving glory to God. Yes. So he's um, already um, awakening and being prepared to receive the second and third angel's message, the truths of God. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Yeah, so I, I found the I found the verses, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 14. It says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. There you go. What was that? Romans what? 12, 2? No, Romans 2, 14. Okay, 2, 14. Okay. Very good. Love that he does quote Romans, but he didn't give the, the chapter and the verse. Okay, very good. Okay, so what's God gonna do now that you know he sends Peter? Uh, you, you know, well, oh, I just told you what he's gonna do. Okay, we'll go to the next one. So let's read Acts 10 5. And now Send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. This is what God does, because he sees the character of this God-fearing man, Cornelius, and he wants to go to Cornelius, so he sends Peter through an angel. So God sends an angel and tells him to go and find Peter so that he could be instructed on what to do next. This man is considered to be a devout man, a spiritual man, a man that worships God, 
but he doesn't even know who God is. He's not a Jew. And if he's not a Jew, how, how can he know God? And we're talking about this again. It's a, it's a mind boggling thing. Even back then, I'm sure when uh, Peter was told to go to this Gentile's home, <laughs> I mean, I, I, can you imagine what Peter must have been thinking? You know, this is the first time a disciple has to go out of their mindset of Jews and go now to the Gentiles. Yeah, well, this, I think it wasn't it right prior to this that he had the vision of the sheet. And isn't it explained in this chapter? Yeah, maybe. He doesn't talk about that, but he talks about the angel going to him. Yeah, he, yeah. yeah. That before he has to go out, he does have that vision. Yeah. Okay. So who is Cornelius? Well, he's a, he dev he's a devout man. He's a spiritual man. He's also a Roman. He's also a centurion. He's a Gentile and he's a pagan. It's, just, it's, it's nothing that we would even think anybody like this would know God. But what does he do? What does he do? It's what Susan said. He feared God, he prayed to God, and he gave alms. Let's read Acts of the Apostles 139, page 139, paragraph 3. Thus was the gospel brought to those who had, who had been strangers and foreigners, making them fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Oh, wait a minute. What, where am I? Oh gosh, I'm all messed up. Wait, hold on. First fruits of the harvest. See, I knew I was going to get messed up here. First fruits of the harvest. Just go back one page. Go back one page. Oh, who is Cornelius? Isn't that the quote you're reading? Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. Sorry, this is all new to me. It's so much easier when you just read off the screen, but I can't do that now. <laughs> so. You're doing great. Thank you. Okay, so they're strangers and foreigners. They're going to be made fellow citizens with the saints. Who are the saints, the Jews or God's church? They're all going to become members of the house of God. Now let's read the next sentence. The conversion of Cornelius and his household was the first fruits of the harvest to be gathered in. So Cornelius is the first fruits, it's like what Fell said, of the harvest for the Gentiles. First fruits of the harvest for the Gentiles. This is what makes him so important. Do we remember our previous study where we talked about the church in the world and how the gospel message was never given to the world? Does anybody remember that? The gospel message was only given to God's people. And Parmender said, the world has no hope of ever being saved. And why is this? Why does the world have no hope of ever being saved? It's because the world never receives the gospel. Okay. So Can let's I go ask ahead. a question? Yeah, yeah sure. Oh, thank you. On that pre yeah, that slide. So we know that this that Cornelius is a Gentile and a first fruit. Does that hold true for the Levites? Well, yeah, because uh, I really felt like Darren, the one here at the home, that it, the Lord was showing a first fruit. Um, yes, in yeah. him. When you said that too, I thought to, the first thing I thought was first fruits. Yeah, that came to my mind. Not God. not what the day it happened, but during this study with all of us, it came in my mind, right? Yes. So I'm wondering, is that true? Yes. I, I, in your in your specific individual situation, it's bringing it down on a on a scalability on a fractal level. I do believe it is. God is working right now with the Nathanims. And and even the Levites too. The so Levites. Yeah, the Levites. We're going to have more first fruits of the Levites come to each of us. 
Yes, but he's he hasn't he's not waiting for uh, done with the uh, the Levites and then he's starting now. And and Parmender did this 2019. Yeah, wow. Yeah, he's starting now. Well, back they're, they're, they're look at their timeline um, for the Levites and the Nephites was uh, 9/11 was the beginning of their plowing for the Levites and 2014 I think was the beginning of the plowing. For, I think that's what it was. So they're actually in there. The, the Levites are actually in their latter reign. Take that into perspective of yes. where, where were we during our latter reign? We were already here. Yep. Yep. We were already here. So. Um, during our latter rain period. So the Levites are in their latter rain period and the, the Nephinims are in their former rain. So we're gonna like that experience that you had, uh, Susan, I think that that's kind of prophetic and uh, it, it's, it's that you even shared it today um, because we're gonna, begin, I think that that's gonna happen in each of our lives. We're gonna- That's what I was hoping yeah. that it meant, that it's like a, a forerunner of think of what's to come. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have to get ready. I mean, we're all thinking, okay, we still got time and, you know, but actually, no, we don't have any time. We have to be ready now. <laughs> we, Amen. we have to be ready now. Any more additions here? Okay, so we're going to go to Daniel 1141. He shall enter also into the glorious land. Oh, no, wait, sorry, wrong one. Okay, we said that in this chart here, it's the world, but God's people, but it's God's people in the world here. It's God's people in the world. It's not the world. It's God's people in the world. Do we remember this? Um, Revelation 18, 4, it says, come out of her, my people. We know this to be Babylon or the world, and my is a reference to God. Come out of the world, God's people. This is a call to the church, but we wouldn't call it a church. We'll just call it God's people that are in the world. Do we understand that? So it's not the world. It's God's people in the world, just like the Samaritans. It's yes, God's, it was God's people who are still in Babylon. Yes, yes. Same thing. Okay, hold on. I don't know why I'm having a hard time. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we're going to go to e Daniel 1141. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, the chief of the children of Ammon. Okay, it talks about Edom, Moab, and Ammon. In the English, it says chief, which means the first fruits of Ammon. If you check their history, each one of each one in some shape or form is connected or related to God's people. We've also been learning about the Samaritans, who they are, who they were, who, who were the, the Samaritans. We know that they come from Samaria, which is a city, a country. It's also a group of people. And I think last time I did my other study, um, Troy said that the Samaritans, um, they're also a group who are called the 10 tribes of Northern Israel. And they are sometimes identified as Ephraim. If you go to Ezekiel 38, there are two sticks that are mentioned. One of those two sticks represent God's church. And the other one is a symbol or representation of those people who were God's people who were in the world and then they came out of the world to join the church. Do we get that? Yes. So they are God's people. They're not in the church though, but they are God's people, but they're going to come out of the world and come into the church. Be beautiful um, illustrations you have. Oh, thank you. I don't I know where you found that, but no, it's just perfect. Just, just Google. It's yeah. It. Okay. When we talk about the church and the world, we think about it in two stages. The church, the world, and then this is the, the earth. There's going to be a message that's given, and it's the message, which and the, the same and the same message, which is the everlasting gospel. So these two messages are the same message. It's the everlasting gospel. 
The first part is targeted at the church and it will do a work. That work will be in two stages here and they'll come out. And it's a call to call the people out, out of the church and out of the world. Same message, everlasting gospel. Any questions? First, the message is given to a dead church. And we know that the church is dead because it's in a Laodicean condition. If you go to Revelation 3, the story of Laodicea, we know that the condition of a Laodicean is not someone who is lukewarm because there's no such thing as a lukewarm condition. There's only dead or alive. There's no in-between experience. Someone who is lukewarm means that someone is cold but pretends to be hot, which means they're not genuine. You can't trust them. Any questions? If we go to Matthew 23, 25, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Now, sensible people would think if you're going to eat from a dish, you would wash the inside, not the outside. However, these people make the outside clean and they leave the inside dirty. When you look at a bowl, all you see is a clean bowl, but that's not true. What are they not showing you? The inside. What's on the inside? Yes, right, Val, because it's unclean. Therefore, this bowl is pretending to be clean, which makes it not fit for purpose. Just think of this bowl as a person. Who uses persons? Who uses people? Do you mean oppressors? No, I mean, well, no. Well, yeah, people can use people, but some, somebody else uses people. God? God, God uses people. So God wants, uh, wants to use us and we look and we say, hey, use me because I'm, I'm good here. However, when God, when he comes closer to have a better look, it turns out that you're not fit to be used. So you are deceptive and hypocritic. You pretend to be clean. In Revelation 3, you pretend to be hot, but on examination, what you really are are dirty or dead. Just like the fig tree that has all those pretentious leaves on it. And when Jesus went to look underneath, there's no fruit whatsoever, but right. it looks wonderful on the outside. Right. Not fit for use. Let's turn to Matthew 23, 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whitened sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So he says you are like white sepulchers, which would be tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but unclean on the inside, just like this bowl. In Revelation 3, it says hot and cold. Hot is alive and cold is dead. The first one we saw was a bowl that was clean on the outside and dirty on the inside. Now we have a tomb. They look white on the outside, but they're dead on the inside. It says you're, they're full of dead men's bones. This is a good description of a Laodicean. And the dead men's bones aren't only their bones, but of the people that they've killed, or if you follow what I'm trying to say, they're responsible for the death of other people. Oh yes, they have blood in their hands. Absolutely. They're you hypocrites. Know? They're they're yeah. They're and hypocritic that, and they're deceptive. Dead men's bones again takes you back to Ezekiel 37, where he's yeah. Can these bones live? And that then goes into the story of the two sticks. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So in our time, well, uh, so when we so we know now that um, the Adventists are hypocrites. 
They look good on the outside, but inside they are like dead men's bones. This gospel message is going to two groups, the priests and the Levites. They will accept this message and then they'll come out. There's also another group that accepts this message, but they come out of the world. We call them the Nethanims. We can also call them the Samaritans. So we can call them Samaritans, Nethanims, Gentiles, there's all different names. These people that come out have accepted the gospel message. If you accept the gospel, which kingdom are you in? You're in the kingdom of God. Oh, kingdom. Yes. When we talk about first the church, then the world, we're not talking about worldly people here. Symbolically speaking, it's God's people that are in the world. Remember in the previous study, we talked about the Syrophoenician woman. She is considered to be part of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So as the Jews were, so is this woman. Remember, they, the Jews didn't consider her one of them, but she was. If we go to a worldly place like a marketplace and we give a message, all the people that respond are considered God's people. Then you go to the church and all those people that respond are considered God's people too. We all agree with that? Yes. Okay. The rest who didn't respond were considered to be this mountain here. That's just been cast out and they're not, it's not even mentioned in Je Daniel 2. The imagery in Daniel 2 is of a stone being cut out without hands, and it hits this image on its feet and breaks it into many pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. So this mountain here is a Seventh-day Adventist church, and this mountain is not considered God's people, and it's not even mentioned about them in Daniel 2. Midway, yes. yeah. If um, there's a um, compare and contrast that Elder Prime Minder does with the mountain and the stone and the, um, and the statue with the chaff. So, yeah. so there are, you know, when, when, when things are, when things are not specifically mentioned in the well, in the okay. in the verse you know he puts a balance uh, and then he puts a beam across the balance and so whatever is mentioned on the one side he also mentions it on he also supplies it on the other side even though it's not mentioned yes yeah so if you got the mountain then you got the statue you got you know the chaff then you got to have the wheat yeah. And, and then and so the stone comes out of the mountain and whatever is left, whatever comes out is God's people and whatever is left is of the world. That's right. Absolutely. Perfect. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Okay. So however, midway through the verse, the imagery uh, uh, changes, suddenly changes from the stone hitting the statue to the chaff of the summer threshing floor. So you've got it right on, Phil. What becomes chaff? What becomes chaff here? Well, that's going to be, that's what's going to be discarded. This. Uh, right, the statues, the, what, the things that are still of the world, which will, yes. be which will be blown away. Right, which would be the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold. This becomes chaff. So what is chaff? It's the protective fibrous outer coating that surrounds the wheat berries that is indigestible. In order to get to the nutrients inside the berry, you have to mechanically remove the outer coating. The important point is that there is a separation work going on here. So that is what's the significance about the chaff. We also know that there's a separation work going on here at the mountain with the stone. That's the imagery of the world in Daniel 2. The statue, we know that something has to come out, but we don't see that in this chapter. There's no verse that tells you when to come out, 
You have to do a lot of digging and you have to understand the agricultural model in order to understand and to see what's going on. Okay. Any questions, comments? Thank you so much for the comments. Okay, the emphasis, however, is the threshing, the threshing floor. So we want to separate the wheat from the chaff. In order to do that, we have this threshing floor, and then you have all these berries on top of them. And what do you do with them? Well, you have to smash them first before you shake them, because if you just shake them, the outer coating isn't going to come off. It has to be struck very hard with a hard tool or a hard message. This message is so hard that it, it destroys the statue, but we're gonna destroy it on the threshing floor. So we need to know what a threshing instrument is. They come in different shapes and sizes. The one we'll look at is two sticks joined together by a chain and it's used by a person to beat these berries hard enough and long enough that it breaks the outer coating and then begins to separate. Eventually the chaff will be separated they are separated but are still together. So what needs to happen at this point? They're separated now, but they're still together. You have to put it in a, in a sheet or in a basket. Yeah, and so then you'd have to separate it. Yeah, you have to separate it. You lift it up and the chaff gets blown away. Yeah. Everybody. Yes. So what? I, lo I love your illustration of the two sticks that I know, are threshing, I know. that, that was perfect. You know, do you know that that wasn't hard to find because they don't have these things anymore. You know, this yeah, is they that, did it. that's wow. Can you that imagine? just makes it so clear too, right? Do you, do you see how the hard work they had to do? Yes, I mean that's, that's symbolic of the of the priests and Levites connected together threshing the wheat. Yes. <laughs> And it's a very hard, it's a hard message. It takes a lot of work. It's not an yes. easy message. So what does, okay, wait, I lost myself here. Okay, hold on, where am I? Okay, so what does the work of separation? What separates the chaff from the wheat from the chaff? I mean, like literally. Wind, the wind. Wind. Yes, and the wind carried them away. A wind is going to blow all this chaff away, and what will be left? Just the wheat. And we know what the wheat is a symbol of in God. It's God's children. So we know that these wheat are the same group of people in Revelation 18.4. What does God call these people in Revelation 18.4? My people. My people. So we know that Daniel 2 is just a repeating story of Matthew 13, Revelation 18, and Daniel 1141. They're just repeating themes with different <clears throat> imagery. Okay. Okay, this is just a reminder. The world will not be saved. According to Acts 10, who are the people that will be saved? It's the devout people, those people who follow God, even if they don't know who God is, they'll receive further instruction. It's based upon their faithfulness. Isn't that beautiful? Now these people don't know who God is, but they're called the devout ones. When Jesus spoke to the Syrophoenician woman, he said, I've healed your daughter. So after he healed her daughter, did he have any other interaction with her? Does anybody remember that story? Did, did Jesus do anything else after he healed her, her, her daughter? No, he had no more interaction, no more instruction, no more disciplining. This is very important. This is important. Why is it important? What did she ask for? What, this is, what did this Syrophoenician woman ask for? Crumbs falling from the table. Yes. 
that's what she received because she asked for crumbs. She ate the crumbs off the table and was satisfied. And we know, not, we know that this is not what God wants for us, right? We, he, he doesn't want us to eat crumbs off the table. So what does the crumbs represent? Does anybody, anybody can guess. She ate the crumbs off the table. So it's pieces of bread. Left, you know. Yes, 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 uh, exactly. Le a leftover. Le a, a little bit more further with that thought. What does message? bread? bread remnant. The message. The remnant. Which message? Our message? The bread. What does bread represent? Well, bread represents right. a message. Truth. Word. It message. represents the gospel. It means she didn't receive the full gospel. Remember, she only got crumbs. In fact, she didn't get anything from God. She wasn't converted. She wasn't baptized. But she did have an interaction with him. Can I just make a comment? Yes. This is so beautiful. I never... I never looked at it from that point of view. I just I know. I, I, I when I was doing this, I was like, "Wow, this is just but life." Yeah, but she could have gotten more than that, but she, you get what you ask for. Yeah. Yep. And and also comes to mind. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I, I forgot. Well, she 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 asked for something, but the the trick here is when she received the crumbs. She was satisfied, so she didn't ask for any more. And God doesn't want that for us. Yeah, and I'm sorry to interrupt again. There was also a, a moment that I discovered, you know, that I had like that when I just discovered, wow, this is so mind blowing. When Old Testament talks about a, um, you know, the, 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 the event around when um, Moses was on the mountain, right? And uh, the God's people were around the mountain, right? At the foot of the mount of the mountain and anyway they sent moses to go to the mountain and talk to god and and the way all the test puts she's like saying you know that they got what they asked for yeah what meaning that it it didn't need to be that way they all probably even meant to go up on the mountain but they instead because they misunderstand the character of this uh, God that they have, you know, they transfer their ideals of a God, uh, they are, you know, Egyptian God, uh, God ideas, uh, onto the, onto this God, you know, the, the true God, and that's why they are fearing him, afraid of him, and that's why they don't want to go there, and they are saying, you know what, you go for us, and you talk to, to him, right. this is the same, the same idea, which, which is really fascinating, I really like it, thank you. Yes, and you know, uh, so she ate the crumbs and she was satisfied. Um, so therefore, when you're satisfied with something, you don't come back for more. But it also, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it also um, shows her appetite wasn't hungry enough. Yes. And that's going to be the nethanims. That's, they're not, you know, they're not going to be like us. So we have to but be ready. We've been hungering and thirsting and look how much God is feeding us. But you have to have an appetite for it. If you don't, yes, then you'll just be satisfied with a little paltry meal. You know what I mean? Yes, a sample. You're going to be happy with the sample, the poultry sample pulsary. and the poultry sample. <laughs> my husband, we're laughing because my husband also says, can I have a poultry sample? <laughs> he says that all the time but yeah, anyway I, I, have a, I have a question yeah since we're not talking about the jews we're talking about the gentiles mm -hmm. is this enough what do you mean for salvation well, look at the book of acts um the book of acts tells us a lot that you know when you look at the this is the jerusalem council and the discussion on what brings what enters them in what qualifies them and there were there was less than than what you know like look at our experience how much we've had to go through they're right. they're in they're in um they're being pre so prepared that it doesn't take understanding all things to choose to call upon the name of the lord and be saved they already love the lord they're devout all the things that she listed on cornelius they're praying to god they 
they fear God. They just don't know these things. Yes. So when they get some of the some of the crumbs, um, that's all they need. Yeah, you know what? That's beautifully said. It's true. Um, so when we're, you know, when we when we come across an ethnic, and we're going to be because Jesus Jesus goes before the world. In other words, when you're looking at this graph here, uh, in the next couple of pages, you'll see that the Syrophoenician woman was here. He came to her here, and then the um, Samaritan woman he came to her here. So he came here, but the gospel didn't go out to the world to here. So he came before. We're, that's going to happen to us too. So there's going to be people. These nethanims are going to come before, and we have to be ready now. And and just like Elaine was saying, they're not going to be. They're not going to be like us. They, they, and they won't necessarily need to know everything that we know. Well, the Jews were really an Adventist, are really filled with all kinds of wrong ideas. And after the Laodicean condition, all these years and and we have so much to unlearn. Yeah. They don't have all those prejudices necessarily within them. And, you know, I know I can speak for myself, came in with all this, uh, and I came in with no religion whatsoever. Um, That's the amazing thing about your story. And then, <laughs> and then, um, but then, you know, still you get filled with, with the literal understanding of things because I was, you know, I read my way into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and so you have this literal understanding of things, and yet you kind of grow and start seeing there's, you know, spiritual understanding, it's a process, but you still have these things to to let go of, that when you realize so many things that you had wrong, that you have to be willing to let them go, and, and I've kind of watched as the movement goes along, just from my vantage point, I'm sure there are others that seem a lot more than I do, but we can be really slow and stubborn to to adapt to the new things we learn and yet what what he's been teaching us is to have faith in the movement to be ready to this is my own understanding anyways from my own experiences anyways that that um we should be ready as a movement to understand that he is leading this movement and when something comes out that we might um you know goes against what we've always known we should be more and more willing because he has been increasing our faith using the lines and the lines are teaching us this when what we've always known is that we should be ready to go with the lines and this without question because that's what the line says and so we 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 cause our own delay in um in this process by wrestling with the things that that he is demonstrating to us on the lines whereas you're going to have the Levites and the Nethanims. They're um, even even the Levites, from what I understand, that they they will be quicker to come on as well um, in the state that they're being that they're being prepared for as well. Yes. Yeah, I know there's one, and, and Tony knows this one too. Um, there's those we see on Facebook that are you know at the church where we went to, but um, one of them she posts things about um, equality and uh, women's rights and, and oppression and all the things that we're learning. And she does not know this. So you can imagine how ready she's going to be when, um, you know, as, as a Levite to receive this message. This is going to be like the woman at the well. It's going to be this refreshing that they've longed for and weren't receiving. Right. Some will be like that and some will be like um, the Syrophoenician woman. Okay, so it represents the gospel. That's the crumbs. The crumbs represents the gospel. It means she didn't receive the full gospel. In fact, she didn't get anything from God. She wasn't converted. She wasn't baptized, but she did have an interaction with him. This woman and the woman at the well the Samaritan woman both received the gospel right here in this history. See here, the gospel didn't go out to here, to the world. They got it beforehand. First fruits. Another picture of the yeah you know, as a group. Of course, Cornelius was the first fruits, really, but these are another picture of it. Why is God going to these people before He's supposed to? Why is he? Why is he doing that? He's teaching his disciples 
He's trying to break down their prejudice against them. Yes, yes, absolutely. Here it is. This is the area, gospel to the world. God's going there. And I'm going to read what we read this morning, just a little piece, because this gives a better picture. As Jesus still sat at the well side, he looked over the fields of grain that were spread out before him, their tender green touched by the golden sunlight. Pointing his disciples to the scene, he employed it as a symbol. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And as he spoke, he looked on the groups that were coming to the well. It was four months to the time for harvesting the grain, but here was a harvest ready for the reaper. It's the same thing what we're doing. It's, it was four months back in his, you know, dispensation at his time, but we're looking at the time. This is the four months before. So it's just a neat picture how this all works together. This parable teaching is so amazing. Sister, and, Lana, huh? Sister Lana pointed out that, well, we know that the women are churches, but they're also women. And Sister Lana pointed that yes. out. Yes, yeah. you're absolutely right. That's symbolic too. Lots of symbolisms there. And one woman. You know, in the story. Yes, go ahead. I'm just gonna say. I'm just gonna say in the story. Uh, you know, the 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 mother is asking for her daughter, and this we know is a daughter of her churches also, and the daughter's healed. So yes. this tells us that these people are going to be coming out of these churches. They will be healed. Yes. Yep. Well, and the world. Yes. Yes. Right. People like what we've been understanding with the Protestant line, how yeah, the old school, new school, um, modernists, fundamentalists, all that, how they they um, have to transition. So that, that's what they're being prepared for is to make that transition into yes. this movement. Yes. And it only took the crumbs. Yeah. So I think this is a really clear picture. I'm, you know, it's, it's really getting in my mind about this whole parable right here. So when we understand the relationship between these three groups, this way mark here is this one here. So we have Sunday law to Sunday law. And then we have what's called the world, which lines up with what we call the harvest. This is a story where Cornelius is going to join the church, you know, right here. However, Cornelius already has a relationship with God, doesn't he? We see it all the way through here. A plowing, a former rain, latter rain, and then here. He joins the church. He joins the church here. So when we come to this story here, it lines up with this way mark here, which is Panium. In our current history, this is the experience that these Gentiles are having. They are in communication with God, but they do not fully understand who he is, or they are not fully committed to his cause. So when we come to the line of Christ, which is here, of course, he would have an interaction with these Gentiles because we see these Gentiles over here that they will have an interaction with God. So because of these two women, we know that the Gentiles in our time, the Nethanims, will have an interaction with God. Do we understand that? Any comments? Is this understandable? Very good. Yes, Sister, Sister Jones. Okay. I'm confused with the Nethanim's line, though. It okay. seems like it's over two times instead of one. Look at, why is it 2014 not lining up? Did I miss something? Yes, yeah, I think she just moved it over to line up with that other graph. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't put it, like, over here. I just, I, I put it here so that it would just be a bigger, I, I probably should have moved it out this way. 
Okay. But then even with if I moved it out this way, I blew this one up a little bit uh -huh. so we can see it more. Okay. That's but, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it wouldn't actually it would normally line up. Yeah, it would line up, but I just made it bigger because we're focusing on the nethinems. Okay, thank you. No, thank you for letting me know that. Okay, if you go to the story of the Syrophoenician woman, how does Christ even meet her on the road? How does Christ meet her on the road? What is she doing on the road? She's looking she's for following water. him. Isn't she looking for him? Yeah, she's looking for water. She's already heard about him before, and now she's searching for him. And Jesus goes to meet her. It looks like a coincidence, but it's not. The Samaritan woman, on the other hand, wasn't looking for him. However, if you research her history, you'll see that her heart was already being drawn to God. So we know that these Gentiles, whom we call Nethanims or Samaritans, are already having a relationship with God. These two women are on the right side of these issues with this interaction they are having. They are not like other Samaritans that reject Jesus. These ones understand who God is and how he operates. Okay, so they're both different. Their circumstances are different, but they're the same. They're God's people. Do we understand that? Yeah. Uh -huh. In the literal, literal story of Cornelius, what does he do or what is he doing? He prays, he give, gives alms. He prays. he prays, he reads about God, he gives alms. He's behaving like a Christian. So in this history, we are not expecting these people to be Christians. We've got to understand that. They're not going to be Christians. They can be any religion or they can be no religion. But they do know what God they serve. They do know God. However, they don't have a conscious awareness that they are serving God, because according to the book of Romans, this is what Fell read, what did they do naturally? They naturally do good, but all we need to know is to define what good means. Good does not mean that they eat properly or that they dress properly or that they even live in the right place. Good means how you treat people and that's what people are being tested on. This is the test right here, how you treat people. Wait, sorry, okay. They're not being tested on what they eat or what they, or what they wear or where they live. These people are not being tested on the health message. They're not being tested on the dress message. They're not being tested on country living. They may be vegan or they may not be vegan. They may live in the country or they may not. This is not their test. So what is their test? We know that they had a message and it was based upon the response that they come out. However, what we need to ask ourselves is, is their message the same as the message to the priests and the Levites? Or is it a different message? Is it a different message, anyone? I think it's the same message. I would have to say the same message. I mean, gospel is the gospel. That's right. The everlasting gospel to the final generation, Revelation 14, 6 to 11, it's the same message to everyone. What do you think the subject or the issue is about? What is the subject of that message? The gospel message. How we treat people. How we treat people. Yep. That's what it's all about. Are they going to be tested on whether or not they're vegan? No. Then that means 
that these people aren't going to be tested, aren't going to be either. These three groups of people who come out of this system are not being tested on what they eat or how they dress or where they live. They are being tested on other issues. Mm -hmm. So these people, as well as these people are not being tested on what they eat, what they wear and where they live. That's not the test. Now this doesn't mean that you shouldn't be careful about what you eat and how you dress and where you live. This is not an attack on the reform message. It's not saying that we shouldn't live this way. The two meal vegan diet is the way we should live. It's not undoing any of that. What we need to be clear about is that the test that's going to be brought to God's church is the same test that's going to be brought to the world. It has to have one property. And what do we call this? We talked about this in the previous study. It's one word, starts with an S. And what Troy put in, scalability. Okay, scalability, yep. The same message has to go to the individual, the group, the church, and the world. In other words, it has to be applicable to every group because it's the same message. The same message has to be given to the church. It cannot be a different message because that would be a different test. Do we all understand this? It's all the same message. We're going to read uh, second select messages, page 80, paragraph four. Ellen White is in a controversy with a false prophet. This false prophet is being supported by a man by the name of Mr. Garmeyer. The false prophet's name is Anna Phillips, and this letter is to her supporter, which is Mr. Garmeyer. This is the introductory thoughts to the main argument that we are now developing in our movement as to why there is no literal Sunday law. Okay, the main thought is that we need to be consistent because Ellen White says, consistency, you are a precious jewel. She responds to his comments saying, you say that Anna's vision, visions place the image of the beast after probation closes. This is an error. You claim to believe the testimonies. That's code for you claim to believe in me. But you need to be straight on one point. God has clearly shown me that the image of the beast is going to be formed before the close of probation. The reason for that is because the image of the beast is the great test for God's people by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Okay. Um, I, there's this little bio that I thought was kind of interesting. This is Anna Phillips. So I'm just gonna read a little bit, just a little small little snippet of her. Anna Phillips is, uh, is for a brief time claimed to be another Adventist prophet born Anna Phillips. She was in 1892 legally adopted in her mid twenties into the family of elder Jesse Rice. Never having had a home of her own during her younger years, Anna was more than happy to be their obedient child. Unlike some aspiring after the prophetic gifts down through history, Anna Rice was far from a charlatan. She appears to be, to have been a sincere young woman with a simple faith in God and a great deal of personal insecurity. Sometime in 1892, she began to have what she thought might be prophetic experiences. Her first thought was to seek advice from Ellen White, but White was in Australia. The next best thing Anna reasoned was to validate her gift through A.T. Jones. After all, hadn't Ellen White said that Jones had advanced light? If he approved her gift, she concluded, then her gift was genuine. Jones not only approved of her gift, but encouraged her repeatedly up through February 1894. Beyond encouragement, Jones used Rice's testimonies in public meetings to dis demonstrate that the latter rain had begun and that her testimonies were evidenced of that fact. At, eight, at the 1893 General Conference session, Jones and W.W. Prescott wanted to use Anna Rice's testimonies to bring out the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but the General Conference President, O.A. Olson, refused to let them read them publicly. 
About 10 months later, the President Olson in Australia, with President Olson in Australia, Jones and Prescott brought about a great charismatic excitement in Battle Creek through Rice's testimonies. At that point, the denomination witnessed various charismatic excesses. The Anna White episode was brought to a sudden halt early in 1894 by several letters from Ellen White indicating that the visions had been endorsed without sufficient evidence of their genuine character. Second Celestia's messages 292. The whole business Ellen White claimed was not Anna's fault, but the fault of those who had encouraged her in her visions. Jones and Prescott apologized for their part and promised to be more careful in the future. Anna Rice realized that she had been misled, gave up her claims. She would later faithfully serve the denomination as a Bible worker. I thought that was kind of interesting about her life. Okay, so going back to that great test is going to be um, the test for God's people and it's, which is their eternal destiny will be, will be decided. We all need to understand that the image of the beast set up must happen before the close of probation. For the priest, the image of the beast was set up and we were tested on that issue before November, 2019. It was the great test for the, the priests. Then for the second group of people, the Levites, here's the clo close of probation, 2021. Their great test must come before that. The image of the beast test is happening right now for the Levites, whether they realize it or not. It's in full force right now. The third group, which is the Nethanims, Here's their close of probation, and they're being tested at Panium before their close of probation. This is not what we as Adventists understand the great test to be. The priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims are all being tested before you get to Daniel 11.41. It's before what we would call the big Sunday law. Whether you're the false prophet Anna Phillips or whether you're one of her supporters, the Lord wants to set you straight. The image of the beast comes before probation closes, not afterwards. So this is all very active right now, it's happening. Ellen White is clear what the message, what the image of the beast is, it's church and state. She defines it in the great controversy and in the context of her writings, it's the Sunday law. For the priests, 2019 is the close of probation. And so we have already had our great test. You've either passed or failed that test. For the Levites, the millions of Adventists all over the world are at this moment being tested in preparation for their close of probation in 2021. Then the Nephanims, these people who live in the world, their great test setup will happen at Penium before their close of probation. Do we all understand this? Any questions on this? No. In closing, let's understand with God who God's people are in the world. They're not the world and they're not worldly people. They may or may not be vegan. They may and they may not dress a certain way. They may or they may not live in the country this is not their test. There is only one everlasting gospel message and only one great test for God's, for all of God's people. This is the only one everlasting gospel, only one great test, and it's for all of God's people. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to worship you with thankful hearts, thankful for all that you have done for us and continue to do. I want to pray for a special blessing for those who are praying with us now. May you answer the desires of their hearts. There are people here that are in pain, emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, and many difficulties. Lord, you know them all, but we've come here this weekend to worship you and to learn of you. 
May the truth that you give to us be the means of healing. This, this is our prayer. And we all return and we all return to our homes to take up our individual work. Help us to realize the times in which we live. And truly, Father, we ask that you breathe upon us the breath of God. In our Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Any questions, anybody? Any discussions? Do we have a better understanding of who the Nethanims are now? They're God's people in the world. That's right. It's the, it's 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 this it's it's the it's the Syrophoenician woman. It's the Samaritan. It's Cornelius. It's all these people, but it's one people. They're not. They're not Christians. I'd like to make a comment, if I may. Yes. Um, not a comment. Just an observation about. Hey, put your vote. Yeah, Daniel 2, we have this statue, and when we look at this statue, we usually think about the worldly um, big empires, but if we think about it, every single empire like Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, they were all representing church and state, so in the end of time, when the stone hits this statue, it hits at this principle of state and church. Yes. And this is kind of what we see happening right now in the world. With Cornelius and all the other women, all the other nethanims that um, we see that they were ready. Um, I was watching... Uh, I was on Facebook like two weeks ago, and I have uh, uh, Elaine and Tony knows who this is. Uh, we had a youth pastor at South Central, uh, Steve Allred, and he probably was not satisfied with the with being a pastor, and he went back to school and became a lawyer, and he's posting a lot on. Um, you know, religious freedom and stuff like that. And I was looking at his page. He posted uh, this um, upcoming meeting at the church that where he's at right now. And it says uh, the title was Christian Nationalism. Mm. And I was like, mm. wow, are they talking what I'm thinking it is? Yeah. You know? So uh, I was trying to, to find those speakers on YouTube because I was interested to see what are they talking about. And I came over this other lawyer that um, I listened to his presentation and I was really shocked. He mm. was talking about uh, state and church. Oh my. And he was talking about, uh, you know, that, he is going to dedicate his life and his career, his work to stand against Christian nationalism. He was talking about Trump. He was talking about United States, the Constitution. He was talking about in God we trust and all this stuff that came in this country in times of crisis and how the Christian put that in the, you know, United States and religion and all this. I was feeling like I'm listening to um, Elder Tess. So I was w always wondering because based on the lines, you should have a group of people in Adventism and you should have a group of people in the world that are prepared. And seems like there is, you know, we don't know, but there is a group of people in Adventism that are looking in Christian nationalism, mm. um, and they are, you know, this is the Sunday lot period of time, and they know what's happening. There's people in our church, in SDA, and there's people in the world that are getting ready. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we've been, and that's what we've been learning from the, from the agricultural model, and what she just put up on that, 
Um, yes, yes, but I yeah. was always wondering how is that going to be? Is there always a group that's forming or is just individual people that think about it? You know, I didn't know, but looks like there is a group of people just like us, you know, that yeah. um, are listening and are getting ready. And yeah. another thing, um, when you separate the chaff from the wheat, you have to have wind. Mm -hmm. I saw this happening when I was a child. My grandparents had a wheat field and they had that tool like um, Donna put on her picture and they beat up the wheat and they separated everything, but they couldn't fully separate. They waited for a windy day to, uh, you know, you lift up and you throw in the air um, the wheat and then the wind is going to take away the chaff. And step. if we read in Matthew 3, 12, it I says, John talks about Jesus, says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garden. So that is the process. You have to have a wind. Yes, absolutely. That's what step, that does the final separation is the wind. Yes. What is that wind? Is it the east wind? Well, you know, will it be Islam? When you go into Revelation seven, it talks about four winds. There's four winds, but there's um, right to do a work. So eventually, it's all the winds. Yes. Yep. I was really fascinated by this study. This whole thing. I mean, uh, you know, and this one too about the nethanims really just and it just made it more clear because i was always wondering well how are these nothing's going to be i mean they, they could be muslims they could be but they're not going to be christians that's one thing we have to understand they will not be christians well um going with what christina said um oh, i lost my point of what i was going to say uh that that them them being ready to come in they, they oh well i wanted to make the point of looking at that line of protestantism it goes back again to each of those revivals that came about that that brought about two sides in within protestantism so there are still within the seventh day adventist church there's still a conservative and a liberal side and that's what you're probably because i can i remember steve Allred always being the liberal side Mm -hmm. always be in the liberal side and um and i kind of went a few rounds with him in the early days with a couple of of things but he um but he always had he was always on that liberal side and so that liberal side is the one that is um is is getting this preparation and then when um when panium hits then or actually from what we understand the way marks are a period of time so we might, might at one point mark Panium at a certain time, but we'll be able to look and see that it's been a series of events that, that bring us to that point. But so that they're um, ready and they'll have to do just like the Protestants were supposed to do, had to do in um, the Millerite history, they'll have to transition from this. Um, and we know that in the Millerite history, there was not, there was not two, two Pauls because they were just coming out of Protestantism, if I'm saying that right. So we have two calls to the church. So these, these liberal, um, we came out of conservative, the conservative side, most of us came out of the conservative side of Adventism and made that transition into God's kingdom. And now you have the liberal side that has to make that transition and come out of the liberal side into God's kingdom. So they would certainly be being prepared for it. And it's the events that are taking place. They're they see the atrocities of, of four years of Trump one day after the next. You think it can't get any worse. And, and, uh, and he was always big on religious liberty and understanding church and state, if I remember right. So it's interesting to hear that. Good to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's interesting what you just said too, Sister Elaine, because it made me think of um, uh, Darren, who I shared with you all earlier um here at the home and every time i'd come home he'd be studying it reminded me of our studies 
like he was studying a, a couple weeks ago I come home and he was studying um Attila the Hun and the woes and um yeah you know and then an, another week I'm I'm seeing the sanctuary poster up on the wall and then this week now the two charts on the wall but what I I, I even said to him wow it's like the lord is bringing you on the same along the same path that he brought me on i told yep. him you know and so somehow they're getting this education um like you're explaining to prepare them somehow they're they're being brought along like we were yes and and then, yeah and when they come to that time though they that's their test that's their that's their test that they will have to make that transition that's the test to make yes. that transition just like in 2019 was a test for for ffa they would have had to continue on and they didn't continue on yeah and you know it's kind of amazing because you know with the uh cornelius's situation he was a roman a centurion a pagan but he saw the injustices he saw them and he knew that it was wrong. He gave alms, he prayed. I mean, there are people in the world that see the injustices and the inequalities and inequities and they know and they see it. They're just like, just like, um, uh, you know, Cornelius and his family, they see it. And yeah, then, think about the January 6th insurrection that you, yeah. had, you had mixed within the police, Trump supporters and those that saw yep. the injustices. Yep. So that probably was a big wake up call for a lot of nethonyms, I can tell you that. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. That was, might have been a blessing in disguise. Yeah, uh, Cornelius understood the meaning and the, you know, spirit of the gospel. And yeah. he did not have hypo hypocrisy. No. And all this other stuff that went on in the Jewish nation. Yes. Yep. And he was a Jew. I, I, I was thinking of Liz Cheney too. Yeah. I haven't I haven't had a chance to follow her so deeply like maybe some of you have, but brother um uh, Larry brought out to me that she had been one of the staunchest um supporters in the beginning and re yeah. I, then i read an article somebody posted and and i think also came up in my emails regarding her and how um she actually was part of the reason the gop has gone towards this line of deceptive reasoning they've used to end up where they're at, that she was one of the first ones who promoted this type of twisted reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. Best way I can explain it. But the fact that she took a stand finally, you know? Right. And that had to have taken great courage to stand up like yeah. that. Yep. Um, I couldn't help, I don't know her, I don't know what kind of person she is, but I couldn't help but feel for her um, because that had to have been a very uncomfortable situation to be in and have to be booed, but still stand there and maintain. She, she couldn't go any farther with the lie. She realized she took a stand. And for that, I have to give her kudos on yeah. that. And that's like a turning point. It makes you see that I don't know. She might be the last of the Mohicans that come out because it seems like, you know, she was the first and now the last in right. a type. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's just amazing what we're And that statement that she made that, that by those, those that are continuing with the lie and with Trump, um, that they will destroy the Republican Party and even this nation. Yes. It's exactly yeah. where we're headed. That they, right. this, they destroy and bring down this nation. It's almost, it's, I wouldn't doubt God used her. 
Definitely. Yes, I believe he did. Yes, God definitely used her, her, vo her, her, her words her countenance, everything. She's willing to give up her livelihood, her, her work for her, yes, her reputation. Yep. Uh, that that's pride. And she reminded me, and I'm sure this might not be right, but I have to tell you, she reminded me of a Paul Yeah. because God must've really had to work with her because she was so on the other side of the fence at yeah. the get go. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. The way Paul was. But look at how she's, where she's at now today. It's just amazing. Yeah, it really, that's a really good um, uh, uh, analogy of, of her because, you know, and she's a woman too. Yes. I'm pretty sure she's um, lesbian as well. Oh, okay. really? Oh, no. Well, I, I, she's I'm married. Pretty she is married because okay. oh, cheney had, had a gay daughter that yeah. was then. i don't know if it's liz because liz is married to somebody with the last name perry and he's also an attorney but that doesn't mean that she i mean but i do know what you're saying i do believe he did have does have a gay daughter yeah, i remember that i always thought it was her but i didn't know I just wanted, also wanted to, as Sister Susan mentioned about Miss Cheney, there's some, somebody that I uh, researched on a little bit while I was listening to her, uh, some of her interviews and presentations. It's just the uh, <clears throat> Bill Gates' wife, Melinda, Melinda Gates. And, uh, you know, as a person who has in the past, uh, you know, a distrust towards <laughs> rich people, Anyway, um, I uh, just figured, well, I was listening to this, how much that they have been doing. Uh, that's her, uh, you know, interview that she gave to, I think it's Stanford University. But anyway, she was telling her story how, you know, that she, from her background and how she came to, into the philanthropy, you know, to investing so much money uh, into the research and help and development of the vaccines. Uh, that are available, that would be available for the, you know, third world countries, because many of the vaccines um, <clears throat> for something as simple as, you know, like rotavirus uh, are not available for, uh, for the third, third world countries because nobody, nobody's researching on these things because they are not the problem of the first world countries. And because there is no funding for this kind of research, nobody's helping, nobody's doing this, you know, uh, no research, no serious research has been done in those kind of areas to help the people with the simplest, um, you know, infections. So, and uh, she was telling the story how, before she told, you know, that went into that, she told her story how she, you know, in her background, in her, in her childhood, how she was raised and that she was raised with a goal that she would be a servant and minister of some kind so that and even her, even the group that she used to, um, like a club of some kind, you know, like like we have Pathfinders, right? And some kind of club that she used to be a uh, part of was the minister, they, they, it's called like something like servant. So, um, and, and she said that the whole reason why that they were, you know, decided, uh, you know, was, was her husband to go into the philanthropy and start to, fund and uh, and and help you know uh, and investigate how to help uh, with the simplest problems that the, the the third world countries have was the was was this background to to that their whole point of life is to serve to be servant and it's just really fascinating how much that they have done and how much we have uh, well, okay, not we, but uh, some of the people that, um, you know, believe in conspiracy theories, how much they take the best and they turn, how, how much conspiracy theories damage people, people's reputation and, and, and twist it so much that uh, they make devil out of them. And it's just really fascinating, you know, it's just, I, um, they, she, she tells the story how they were developing, like how they were helping 
women in, in India and how she's she herself she's a feminist okay I, and I never uh, you know looked into that and it turns out to be she her point is that she says that you know we talk about equality so somebody was asking her we have equality you know in this country more or less it's not that big of an issue and then she said to this she responds that well you think that we have equality but in this in on in the rest of the world there is so much inequality that you know so her point is to bring this equality uh to the to the third world countries where women are by default are so subjugated so uh you know uh like you know like the worst class among the in the worst class and uh and uh you know like for example there is um well okay there's there's just too many things going on in the third world countries and uh and and she's saying that that we are nowhere close to any kind of equality and even even if we assume that we have all that equality here which we don't but but uh, but she but she but that was really fascinated me that this is really for for many years right for for so many years they have been working for the good of the people serving for with their whole goal is to be a servant and to dedicate their lives their 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 you know wells into it right and um and uh people ignorant people um you know who believe in conspiracy theories who have nothing else you know you know who have this deep distrust to everything and everybody they look at these people and they say well they are um you know, trying to control you depopulate you and microchip you and you know whatever but it's just really fascinating how big is the the reality you know this the how much some this netanyms and, and i'm not you know the time will tell who is the netanym but i really hope that she is because she is working she was working so hard to bring some kind of equality into the um, you know especially the third world countries where she can reach and uh, that's really fascinating yeah yes yes definitely i agree you know, I, I can't help but look at this picture and um, think about what we read this morning in Desire of Ages chapter 19, when Jesus was with his disciples and he was showing them the field and telling them about, you know, the beautiful glistening, you know, field and golden sunlight. And then how he was teaching them for this very moment right here in this picture where they were going to go out into the Gentiles and have to share that. And this is like the, you know, Jesus is gone here. He's died, he's gone to be with his head. And now his disciples are doing what he was teaching them to do when he was back in Desire of Ages chapter 19. And I just feel like, wow, this is the culmination of it, is that's what we're going to be doing. And um, it's just, it's amazing how he was teaching them. And, and when, when the Samaritans came to him and he went into their village and they greeted him and they, he ate with them. And the, the, the disciples must have been so in awe because they just didn't do that. They didn't go to Samaria and eat with the Samaritans. And Jesus was teaching them by what he was doing and they were watching and they were following and they were probably being very quiet and silent and just participating in, in watching, but they have to now in this scene, they're doing it, Peter's out with his disciples and actually doing what Jesus taught them. Isn't it beautiful? It's like a full, full circle. I don't know, we are just rambling on here. No, you're not rambling at all. And I, I appreciate every single word that you, spoke and that others have spoke and I was thinking I think I wrote it earlier when you were still presenting this study sister Donna that brother fell and sister Logina's study this morning in desire of the ages fits like a glove it perfectly does. with this study you had prepared for us it couldn't be more, perf more perfect it's just the hand of God it and really I could is. hear, I could hear that in your voice earlier in the Desire of the Ages study when you would interject a comment and then go, oh, 
I'll show you in the presentation yeah. <laughs> that I've got, right? Because yeah. you were bubbling inside with the joy because you saw it, you saw because it. I, when, when I was reading it, you know, because you can, you can take a, you know, you can take a chapter, you can take a paragraph and you can make, you know, you can make applications because there's so many different applications that can be brought to even scripture. They're like there's, you know, you can at least get a, a half a dozen different application for one even one scripture so we can do that but when i was watching it this morning when i was you know listening and reading and stuff when you know fell and logina was doing their study i could i it, all the study that i just did was coming to fruition the context was so clear what jesus was doing he was sharing he was showing his disciples how not to be how to how to treat people what the great test is going to be, how they need to be. He was showing them by his actions. And it was just like, I just, I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, wow, it's just perfect. You know, I could understand the context of the, of the chapter of desire of ages, what Jesus was doing. Amen. And you know? your illustrations are simply divine. They are because sister Elaine posted the quote. Uh, I think it's from Zachariah. I have to go back real quick in the, uh, well, in the chat about grabbing the skirt, how they're going to, uh, where is it? Sister Elaine. Um, was it Zechariah? Yeah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days, it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. And, that's Zechariah 823. And Sister Elaine has used that many times in the past um, as a hopeful promise to us of what God was going to do through this message and what we had to look forward to. And it's all like coming all together in your scripture showed the woman grabbing at Jesus's robe. Several times you had that picture in this um study and then also the picture of the two sticks bound together that are used as threshing tools oh yes um, yes, yes yeah i mean those are you yes you googled but god directed you to the perfect scriptures that one there the, yes that one that's the two sticks together being they're bound jointed together being used right yes. to thresh the wheat mm. and you know, everybody's comment and like uh, Sister Lana's comment. What was it? Oh, I just went blank. Uh, but yeah, I just went blank for a minute. But um, forgive me, that happens to me a lot. So I pray that the Lord help me. That helps, um, that helps me too. Brother fell like this, this presentation that him and Logina have been doing has been somewhat extended week after week after week, right? And how often we try to push through to get to the next chapter, but God's like, Terry, you know, and, and prompted Brother Fell to suggest us to continue with that study. Yes. And, and as he's continued each week, we've gone through these studies and taken the paragraphs and the lines with more care. But we've landed, we've continued to stay right with these lessons that are being taught either by Brother Aaron, we've noticed, they go with our study in the morning that Brother Fell and Sister Logina are doing, or this today demonstrates the same thing that God's perfect timing, that's his handprint on everything. You can't make that up. You can't no, you time can't. those things, but He's God's... Rich yes he's reassuring us by these studies amen thank you okay